and mm-hmm. he takes this is this is another wild panel. Um, he yeah. takes a rag and rubs <laughs> the makeup off of Miss Peg's oh. face, <laughs> and she she says, "Let go of me." <laughs> and then what does what does Batman say? Brian? He says, you say it? "Quiet." It's not. Yeah, he goes quiet or Papa spank. <laughs> Welcome to Bat Lessons, the Batman History Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm Alex. And today we're talking about Golden Age Catwoman. That's right. We're, we've been going through the sort of first appearances and creation stories of all of these characters. We did Joker. We did mm-hmm. Batman himself. We've done Robin. And now we've gone to Catwoman. Are you excited? I am excited. Catwoman's one of my favorites. Um, I love the different incarnations of Catwoman across uh, the different... I don't know, platforms between like video games and movies and stuff like that. Yeah. Who was your first Catwoman? First Catwoman? Um, yeah. You know, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I know that for a long, long time when I was young, I wasn't allowed to watch the Michael Keaton Batman movies. So really? it Yeah. So it, it could be that Arkham... I don't remember if it's Arkham Asylum or Arkham City where Catwoman really? shows up. That wow. might be my first Catwoman, yeah. That's crazy to me. Well, mine was definitely would have had to been from Batman 66, the TV show. But um, Oh, I'm an idiot. Uh, animated series. Batman the Animated Series, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who did yeah, I was, uh, who I was... played Catwoman on that animated series? Oh, gosh, I'll have to look that up. Me too. I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it. Adrian Joe Barbeau. I've never heard of her. Barbeau, yeah, no idea who that is. There you go. Well, um Oh weird. Also Martha Wayne. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens a lot on cartoons where they kind of like have one person do multiple voices. Yeah, it's just kind of weird that it's the mother and the potential love interest. Oh, sure, sure. Were th- so I have to admit, I'm not fully steeped in in the Batman the Animated series. Did they have a love interest thing going on on, on the cartoon? Oh, I can't keep it straight. It it seems like everything where they're both in it, there's some sort of uh, sure, sure, sure. love interest thing. I mean, it it is. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll talk about it, but it's from the beginning. Totally. I think my first Catwoman was from Batman sixty six, and there's actually three different women who played Catwoman for Batman sixty six. One for the movie, one for the first two seasons, and then one for the end. And I don't remember who my first was. It probably was Julie Newmar, but. Yeah, uh, it's a character that uh, isn't necessarily one of my favorites, but I think is integral to the character. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. When it comes to Golden Age Batwoman, there's just way less ink spilled. Like fewer people are on the record talking about it, um, about the creation of Batwoman. W- way less than any other character we've talked about so far. So, so the usual spe- suspects we go through, Bill Finger only did limited interviews. He didn't talk to many people at all, ever. And as far as I can tell, he's not on the record about ba- the creation of Catwoman at all. Jerry Robinson is on the record, but he said he wasn't involved in the creation of Catwoman or drawing for her first story in Batman number one. Shelley Muldoff, who was on the record in some of the other ones, wasn't on the record about Catwoman. And that only leaves Bob Kane, who said lots of things <laughs> about lots of stuff. But he, he he does talk about the creation of Catwoman a fair bit, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And I think the reason for that is that Catwoman just wasn't as important to the Batman mythos back then as she is today. Right. That makes sense. Joker, for example, uh, mm-hmm. appeared in over 62 stories during the Golden Age, by my count. Catwoman would appear in just 16. So just way less frequently. If you remember when we were talking about Robert Pattinson, uh, Batman movie, we mentioned that the Riddler had not been an important character to the Batman mythos until Batman 66, the, the TV show, which really raised his prominence uh, uh, as a character. The same is true for Catwoman. Um, she was more of a side character uh, until she was elevated for the TV show. And it's it's not just the creators talking about it. There's there's a dearth of like mm-hmm. content out there about Golden Age Catwoman generally. Like it's possible I'm not looking at the right places, but if you like Google it or you go to YouTube and you search like Catwoman history or Golden Age Catwoman or Bill Finger Catwoman or whatever, you're not going to find much. For example, there's a whole fan blog for for Catwoman is catwomanfan.com with pages and pages and pages just tons of articles and they have like a page on Golden Age Catwoman 
it's it's really it's pretty thin and the books that i have all the history books the books aren't much better so i only found two quotes um, or two people on the record we'll talk about them here in a minute that being said i think it is important to talk about it now because she did appear in batman number one um, and right. we've talked about two Joker stories that happened in that issue already and, mm-hmm. and Catwoman's in there too. Um, so I feel like we had to touch on it if for nothing else to help contextualize the character. Um, when we get to her later in the silver age, we'll, we'll talk about her more and, and we'll see, you know, where she's come from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that all this like setup makes a lot of sense because, um, I, I have suspected because of other things you've said that we're going to discover a lot of famous characters, either, either villains or allies or whatnot, since Catwoman through history is kind of on both sides of that, that it's our, we, we believe are really big because they show up a lot in the movies or in the animated series or whatever. Um, but in the comic books may not be that big of a deal. Um, I, I remember when we uh, talked about the Riddler, a similar kind of thing came up where he doesn't show up all that often, but has showed up a bunch of times between the movies, the TV shows, stuff like that. And so um, the general public has an idea that they're really heavily used characters, but um, it turns out in the comics that might not be the case. Yeah, I think Cap- Catwoman has had um, increased prominence and importance in the comics. Um, she's had multiple solo series, for example, like, and Riddler's not, I mean, I think he's had a couple of mini series, but nothing, um, like a, like a ongoing, right. Uh, Ed Bru- Brubaker, um, did like a famous ongoing Catwoman series. And I know that there was an ongoing in the nineties as well. And so I think nowadays Catwoman's pretty gosh darn important. Tom King, which is one of my favorite Batman runs, um, is just revolves around Bruce and Selena and their relationship together. Um, mm. but definitely in the golden age. Th- that's not really as much of a thing. Right. It, I just, I just had a, a thought of like what other non Batman, Batman characters have a standalone movie. It's just Catwoman and the Joker, right? Um, I think so. I mean, you could kind of count the Harley Quinn, um, birds of prey movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you totally could. And then- do you want to try to, so I guess I could, I could read the question. And you could do the answer. All right. Sure. So this, uh, the, what they asked Bob Kane was, uh, the Catman, w- uh, whew, the Catman, the Catwoman was another great foe of Batman's. How did she originate? Uh, okay. So Jean Harlow had a great influence on me as a kid. I saw her in Hell's Angels with Ben Lyon and James Hall. At my impressionable young age, she seemed to personify feminine pulchritude at its most sensuous. When I drew Catwoman, I kind of had her in mind. Although she was a blonde and Catwoman was a brunette, she was the first influence on Catwoman. I wanted to draw somebody in her image. Bill and I knew we needed a female nemesis to give the strip sex appeal. So we came up with a kind of female Batman, except that she was a villainess and Batman was a hero. We figured that there would be this cat and mouse, cat and bat, byplay between them. He would try to reform her and she was working outside the law. But she was never a murderer and not all evil like the Joker. We felt that she would appeal to female readers. I figured that they would relate to her much as to Batman. Or more likely, she would appeal to the male readers. So she was put in the strip for boys and girls as a female counterpoint to Batman. Question for you. Do you see Catwoman as a female Batman? Uh, I get the comparison, but no. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, Because not really. she's... She's not a hero at all. Like, I I don't know. There's times where she like does the right thing, but she has to be like persuaded to see things the right way. It's just, she's a very gray character. Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. you you don't know if she's, she's good or bad. She's just kind of like dancing in between very Mm -hmm. self-motivated. Um, so no, I don't, I, I don't see her as the, and to uh, the excuse me a counterpoint to batman or or something that even a female reader would be interested in emulating in their own life as like (laughs) her as a role model but i do see like the cat versus bat the (laughs) ears the costume like it is it is a person wearing an animal costume that that does things with in secret the same way that like batman does it's just um but it, but that's about where it ends. Sure. Yeah. 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 So I, I had to, to Google Jean Harlow cause I'd never heard of her. She was an actress that was active, like 
in the, the early 1900s. Like, she died in 1937, so really, really early movie actress. A bunch of movies I've never heard of. Saratoga, Personal Property, Libeled Lady, Susie, Wife versus Secretary. Like, I get the sense that maybe maybe if you're like a big you know movie buff in this era then like you're you, you would know who she is but like um didn't strike me as like historically significant today like this is a uh uh like a pop culture reference that <laughs> is just like um lost to time um but she's you know just like a conventionally attractive like you know movie star of that era she's got the the sort of like bob haircut that's very blonde and curly and Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah in the comic i was very surprised at how they decided to draw her because it's just so different from the contemporary um version of her that i'm familiar with but i I felt that way when we were reading um probably detective comics number one or uh, number 27 Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh and and those really early ones just the way that they draw women in the 1930s is just really different than how they draw them today. Yeah, for sure. And then they, they asked uh, Bob one more question and that was, uh, how did you and Bill come up with the idea for associating with her with cats? It's kind of the antithesis of a bat, sort of a female version of Batman. Only we made her a villain. I always felt women were feline. Men were like dogs. Not that they looked like dogs, but had the personality of dogs, faithful and friendly. Cats are cool and detached, unreliable. Whoa, what a (laughs) comparison. Hang tight. (laughs) I feel much warmer with dogs around me. Cats are hard to understand. They are erratic as women are. Whew. (laughs) You feel more sure of yourself with a male friend than a woman. You always need to keep women at arm's length. We don't want anyone to take over our souls, and women generally have a habit of doing that. (laughs) Jesus. So there's a love resentment thing with women. I guess some women will feel I'm being chauvinistic. Well, I would say a lot of other people would think that too. (laughs) I guess some women would feel chauvinistic. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, big shrugs. I guess some women (laughs) will feel I'm being chauvinistic for speaking this way. But I do feel that I've had, yeah, but I do feel that I've had better relationships with male friends than women. With women, when the romance is over, somehow they're never my friend after that. <laughs> this is so, this is like Freudian. This, it is. It's like, right? you're so close, Bob. You're so close. <laughs> What's the common denominator? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That is a rough read. Yeah, how did you come up with the idea to to make a uh, uh, Catwoman associated with cats? Well, I'm a raging misogynist. You see. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Man, there's so much there because it, it it also like speaks to like his inner psyche of like getting along with men, not getting along with women, and yeah. and it makes me think that like maybe he just had had a uncomfortable like adolescence where he just had trouble asking women out on dates and and i don't know it just makes me wonder like how many times was he married if if his opinion of women or that they just like steal his soul and it could also be that he's just uh talking a really good game right i guess it just doesn't sound like a good game to me it sounds super (laughs) freaking awkward (laughs) well i mean i mean more to say that like um that like there were social norms that made it cool to talk like this, right? Like that, that That's being fair. S- sort of like, um, like the backhanded or about women and stuff, yeah. you know, he, he was only married twice. It says, okay. Do you know what year this came out or that, that this he said this? Yeah. Um, I'm sure I could find out. Cutting in from the future um, did confirm that this interview came from Creators of the Superheroes by Tom Andre. He doesn't say when he asked Bob Kane this question, but we do know that Tom Andre also was the ghostwriter for Bob Kane's autobiography, which released in 1989 to coincide with the Michael Keaton Batman movie. So this interview probably happened for that book sometime in the late 80s. You know what? If I could find out, I'll put in an edit, a little edit. I'll cut in and I'll say when it was. Okay. That sounds good. It's just like if it was the 60s and like this was back when like women in the workplace, should we allow it or something like that? Like, (laughs) oh, okay. Like I I could see. But 
it's just it's it's pretty bad yeah it's pretty bad <laughs> yeah okay so that's everything that bob said about the creation of catwoman i have some stuff that jerry said but i think it will make more sense if we talk about it after we read the comic specifically because i want to talk about you know where catwoman catwoman goes uh, mm-hmm. after Batman number one and, and Jerry wasn't involved in cat Catwoman number one. So do you want to, do you want to summarize and talk about, uh, that issue? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. I'm actually pretty excited to read this one. Cause I noticed a few very interesting things. <laughs> yeah. You, I mean, you, you kind of warned me when you said it's, uh, it's tough, but <laughs> Yeah, so I that's uh, I, I can say this for the show too. Um, I waffled for a long time about which Catwoman issue to read for this episode. I um, I read this one. I read I think number sixty two. I read number sixty five, and I think one before that somewhere in the, in the between. But the I should say this is Batman number one. I think I re- read Detective sixty two and sixty five, not not Batman. Although now I'm questioning myself. Anyway, the point is. There are a few that people say are like significant or important. None of them were terribly interesting <laughs> or good stories. Um, so I just sort of defaulted to the first because that's what we've been doing. So yeah, we'll we'll try to blaze through the summary so that you can have sort of the context of like what's happening and, and see some of the interesting things about like the way that she's portrayed and like the way that they choose to introduce her. But like very much with the the first Robin issue and the first Joker issue, like I thought they were like good stories and like good books. And I would recommend them to someone to like go read. I would not do that with this. I I think most of, and I haven't read it all, but most of the golden age Catwoman that I have read is like not enjoyable. So, yeah. I, I mean, I think it also has to do with like what kind of a recommendation it is. Like, like those 1940s Batman uh, <laughs> serials <laughs> that we keep kind of, we're going to do uh, it. Yeah. It's we coming. keep talking about it, not doing it, but like, I would recommend those to people sure. who want to see some like very very cringy batman stuff sure and this is along those same lines like you you want you want to see some really strange batman decision making <laughs> check this out uh like it's so bad it's it's good like it's enjoyable just because you're like what was happening what 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 precipitated this oh train yeah wreck? yeah it's yeah absolutely it's yeah train wreck train wreck's a good comparison like w- watch i mean just or it's almost like gossip like hey come watch this terrible thing happen sure yeah yeah, yeah. so we open to the ocean we're on the open ocean uh, a large mm-hmm. luxury yacht is sailing along and they describe it as a yacht but think like small cruise liner right oh yeah it's a huge yacht yeah yeah, yeah. and they're doing cruise stuff on the boat the whole time so I think that just might be like a nomenclature thing. So, and then in front of the yacht in the foreground, there's a red speedboat that's like sort of heading towards that yacht. And it's got like a number of people on board. We cut to inside the, the yacht and Dick Grayson. We we only know that because um, it says it in the, in the caption box. This is, this is Robin, right? Dick Grayson. Mm-hmm. He's working as a waiter serving drinks. He's in the suit, a blue suit with a black tie. He's holding the tray with the drinks on it. Right. And it's like, why is Dick doing this? And then we cut to a, a flashback. I did. Wa- I did want to point out a couple of things yeah. on that first Please. page. That I thought were interesting. Uh, so we have talked about the origin of Robin and that Robin is dressed to look like Robin Hood. That is still blowing my mind. Like every time <laughs> I see, like, at, well, we see the font where Robin mm-hmm. is like in a different. It's a different typeface. It's like medieval style. Yeah, medieval style, right? And again, in the in the intro caption, it says. That laughing daredevil, that young Robin Hood of today, Robin, the boy wonder, like it's they're still calling it out. It's it's still like novel and, and interesting to me. And I did think it was kind of an interesting thing separate separately from that, that as part of the setup for like the context of of what's going on is a little like clipping, like a newspaper clipping that says like. Mrs. John Travers is taking a group of selected guests on a trip aboard her yacht. And and it basically describes that it's a special trip and she's taking her half million dollar necklace with her. Um, and, and that is like the the intrigue to get into to, to set the context for the situation. I, I thought that was an interesting storytelling method, too. Just yeah, it's the sort of thing you'd see in a movie, like right? Like we, we cut to the yeah, newspaper, exactly. we, we get to read the headline, right? And and that's, we're in the flashback, right? 
and Batman's reading the paper. He reads about the travelers that are on this this yacht party and the and the mm-hmm. necklace that's going to be on the boat. He thinks that he says aloud, you know, all the crooks in town are going to want to steal this necklace. And then he says to Dick, hey, uh, do you want to take the lead on this crime or on this boat to like make sure this necklace doesn't get stolen? Uh, I've got this other thing going on, but um, I can I can catch up with you uh, when I'm when I'm available and you can you can be disguised as steward. And and like see what's going on and flashback. That's the, that's yeah. the whole flashback. Like, <laughs> why yeah. is Dick here? Well, because Bruce told him to go. Also weird. How, how old is is he? Do you remember? I don't know if they said. Yeah, he's pretty young. I mean, certainly a minor. And yes, he's like, yeah, go go solo fighting crime as a vigilante. It'll be fine. Yeah, he looks like maybe twelve. Yeah. Yeah, and and he uh, yeah he's not he's not very tall. He's like Batman or Bruce Wayne's shoulder height. Mm-hmm. And he even says. Uh, I, th- I thought this was kind of interesting. How would you like to take charge of this case until I get there in time to help you? So I, I kind of took that to mean like, hey, do you want to get this stuff set up? And then I'll make sure to, to swing in at the right time to to save the situation or something. I thought it was, it was kind of a weird way. It's super contrived. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. Like, why would you talk to someone that way? Yeah. Like, and they, they don't tell him, they don't explain like where Bruce is going to be, why he can't be there at the same time. Like, why is he sending Robin alone? He just is. Massive hand wave. Yeah. Yeah. So that ends the flashback. We cut back to the boat and Dick is eavesdropping on a conversation between a man named Denny and two old ladies. One of them is named Mrs. Peggs and the other is his aunt, Denny's aunt, Martha Travers. She's the one that has the necklace, right? She's the one that's hosting the party. She's the one that owns the famous necklace. And we learned that Denny is escorting Miss Peggs, the other old lady, around the party because she sprained her ankle. And Dick is listening to this and he he mentions to another steward, hey, you know, Denny must be a really nice guy for helping Miss Peggs around the party. And then the other steward's like, no, man, Denny's a rat. He's always borrowing money from Aunt Martha, right? And then we see multiple other people kind of approach Miss Travers, Denny's no, he aunt. says he's always he's always borrowing dough from his his aunt, Mrs. Travers. It's not as unless Martha is Mrs. Travers. Yes. Yeah, I feel like I'm doing a bad job here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the the kind of the TLDR is is this dude just describes like basically every person in sight as having having a reason to want money. Like there's a Dr. Wallace gambles and he runs out of money and he borrows money from Mrs. Travers. There's he's, like you said, Denny, he's running out of money. He's a rat. He's always trying to borrow money from Mrs. Travers. So it's, it's almost like Mrs. Travers is having this party and invited all the people that borrow money from her. Yeah. Yeah. There's a scene where her brother, Mrs. Travers brother like comes up to her and says like, I lost all my money betting on the stock market. Can't you loan me some money? And she's like, no, I'm not going to do that for you. And he gets all mad about it. Yeah, he does. Cuts to later. Robin's like watching Denny and he goes up to the side of the boat and he takes this piece of paper and he tries to throw it off the boat and he thinks he succeeds. Like he's walking away to do, 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 do and this piece of paper like flies back in the boat at where Robin is like waiting and goes and retrieves the piece of paper. Yeah, this this is the first point where I stopped and was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's very contrived. I mean, it also is like At this point of reading, I'm thinking, oh, so the only reason they were able to solve whatever the mystery is was because of because of the wind. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, maybe they would have solved it a different way, but yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So he uncrumples the note and he reads it. It's really simple. It says, keep your aunt away from room. Well, something illegible. I don't know. I couldn't read it. My wife couldn't read it. I don't know if you can read it. Mm, I thought it said, we'll try then or something, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, that's what it's, it says. It's, it is pretty hard to read. Signed to the cat. Yes. So Dick puts together that the cat is someone trying to steal the necklace and that he's working with Denny and that um, the cat wants Denny to keep people away from Miss Travers' room. So as he's figuring this out, it turns out too late. Miss Travers comes running out of room and she's yelling. She's going, oh, no, my necklace is stolen, right? She had a detective guarding the safe in, in her room to keep the, the necklace safe. But he's on the ground, unconscious or dead. They don't really say. And I thought this was really stupid. Like, it's already dumb enough that, like, they're advertising that Miss Travers is going to be holding a party on the boat and that she's going to have her necklace with her, you know, in the newspaper. <laughs> but then mm-hmm. to find out that, like, she has it, but, like, it's not with her. Like it's in a safe and it's in a room. Like, why is it on the boat? What was the purpose of like, is she going to wear it later? Like, 
<laughs> Why is the necklace here? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Maybe she was she was going back to put it on or something. But the idea <laughs> that she had it in a safe, she I mean, she announced that it was there. Then she had it in a safe for safekeeping. Mm-hmm. And then she had a private detective there watching watching the safe. And and it, to me, it sounds like a honeypot. Like she's trying to catch someone doing something yeah. bad. So she's contrived this whole situation of like announcing to the world mm-hmm. this this very expensive necklace and then is is going to catch someone trying to steal it because she's yeah. not wearing it. It's just it's such a weird That would make more scenario. sense than what it is, which is Oh yeah, nothing. but that's not what like, she did. Yeah, yeah. Just bad storytelling. Yep. So as she's announcing this, oh no, like my necklace is gone, uh, a boat pulls up alongside the yacht and says, "It's the Coast Guard, we're coming on board." So like boom, 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 boom. We've got like no gets thrown off the boat. Robin reads it. It says that they're going to steal the necklace. The necklace gets stolen. A boat shows up. People say it's the Coast Guard. Great. We're going to investigate who stole my necklace. Thank goodness it's the Coast Guard. <laughs> but predictably, I guess, or not, uh, it turns out that the Coast Guard are actually robbers. So they come on the boat and they get out their Tommy guns and stuff. And they're like, this is a stick up. And they say, Miss Travers, uh, we want we want the necklace. And she's like, oh, no, it's already stolen. You can't have it. And so, like, what do you what what do you do if you're you're here to steal the necklace and it's already stolen, Brian? What do I do? Yeah, It'd be like, oh crap! I would and leave. I guess like, I don't know. <laughs> it's I, I I don't think like a criminal. So uh, that that one really threw me. That they were like, oh well, we're just gonna rob everyone of everything else that's valuable, and hopefully it adds up to the same amount. Yes, it's um, it's they're like, well, I guess we can do a mass mugging. Like, it's a party; everyone here is kind of well to do, I guess, and so we're just gonna take all their valuables. So they like stealing people's necklaces and earrings. The and... joke's on them because all these people actually are just out of money and are there to ask Mrs. Travers to for leash money. off of Miss Travers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're going around like taking taking valuables from people, their wallets and things, yeah. and Dick for some reason decides to like bare knuckle brawl these guys <laughs> with their Tommy guns. And like, he's not in a costume. He's not anything. He just like dives at a dude and like his <laughs> takes his head and like rams a dude in the back in his back. And yeah, starts, starts fighting him. Yeah. And, and he has his quips. So like, I ask you, Alex, like if you're yeah. in a situation that seemed kind of serious, like a bunch of guys with guns are stealing your money. And then some random person runs forward and yells out, Mustn't play with guns, might hurt somebody, and then tackles one. <laughs> what do you do? I'm running. I'm out of there. Like, <laughs> uh, there, there's um a, a video that I saw on Reddit uh recently where like there's a, it's a security camera footage from a restaurant and it's like looking at the dining room, um and it's sort of like indoor outdoor so like it's open to the outside but they're like it's covered and they're all sitting at these tables and like there's these two people that are clearly on the date. Uh, on a date together and like there's a guy and a girl and like they're eating and they're talking and whatever and then a dude shows up with a gun he walks to the bar and is like clearly sticking up the barman and the dude just like stands up and walks away <laughs> he just leaves it's one of the funniest things I've, i think i've ever seen uh and it's while <laughs> the chick he's on a date with is like watching the the dude at the bar right and she's like like going what is going on right and then she looks back and her date's just gone <laughs> he just peaced out <laughs> <laughs> he's like oh yeah. i don't know you i'm out of here <laughs> yeah i'm not trying i'm not trying to stop for someone with a gun are you kidding me oh I'm my out. gosh I'm that's gone. funny every man for himself apparently that's funny so yeah like robin is is you know in his steward costume he's punching people he says i don't like your face you know mm-hmm. uh, and for some reason at some point he dives off the boat like as they're shooting at him he decides that he's gonna go into the water And one guy's like unloading a Tommy gun into the water and they're like, do you think we got him? And they're like, oh yeah, totally. He's not coming back up for air, but we see him underwater and he's just holding his breath and he's like, oh, time to ditch the steward uniform. And he, he, you know, dresses up. Now he's dressed as Robin. Like I guess he had it under underneath magic. And the gangsters, I I guess are are like, they're not letting anything stop them. Nothing's raining on their parade. So they're, they're like, let's get the loot. Let's get on the boat. So they all load back up onto this red speed boat and they leave. So they're on the ocean, you know, speeding away from the yacht. And as the, as they're leaving, a third boat rocks up and it turns out it's Batman. So Batman jumps on the boat and he starts punching dudes. Right. And as he's doing it, Robin 
somehow ends up on 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 the gangster's boat and he uses a rope and kind of like a, like a like a lasso <laughs> but like a gigantic one ties them all up at the sa- same time <laughs> so he throws it over this like massive like i don't know seven gangsters and like yeah. pulls it and now they're all tied to each other now now imagine alternate universe yeah. Batman comes in, beats up these guys. He's capable of it. No one sure. ties up the gangsters. He he deals with them and then is like, oh, where's where's Robin? Where's where's the young boy that I sent to fight crime? Oh, bullet riddled body floating <laughs> in the water. <laughs> well, I guess Found I shouldn't him. send him out on his own. <laughs> <clears throat> now, kids, <laughs> you've learned your lesson. <laughs> I guess that, was, that was a lapse in judgment you know <laughs> uh, so yeah then batman batman's talking to robin he says oh my other case went cold so i came here to check out check on the yacht check on you but then i saw the boat mm-hmm. speeding away um and then for just some bizarre inexplicable reason he decides he, it's unclear who he's talking to if he's talking to the gangsters or if he's talking to robin or i guess he's talking to us the reader he says i'm going to i'm going to teach you a lesson um, it, he's breaking the fourth wall here. He says, I'm going to show the kids of America I guess how so, yellow yeah. you rats are without your guns. <laughs> and I'm going to let Robin beat the crap out of you. Like that's, <laughs> that's yes, what it is. Th- that's the scheme. He t- <laughs> takes away all the goons' guns, unties them, and lets them fight Robin to prove to us, the reader, I guess, that, that all of these gangsters are cowards. Mm-hmm. Which doesn't make any sense to me because Robin just tied them all up when they had their guns. So I don't know how letting them fight again, but without their guns is supposed to be interesting to us. Like, Robin just won this fight. Let's see it again. Yeah. Well, I I think the difference here, if you were looking for differences, is that Robin won't have uh, the element of surprise. They're Mm. face-to-face, bare-knuckle boxing or whatever. But, But he, I think... Ultimately, he does not show that they are yellow. Yellow meaning cowardly. Sure. Uh, because they they do go fight him. They just lose. Right. But they absolutely, they're not like, oh, I don't have guns. I'm going to cower away from this little boy. They're like, no, we're, we're going to beat the tar out of this kid. <laughs> and then he beats them up. And then they're like, uh, wait a second. He's, he's beat us up. He's proven that he can beat the tar out of us. I wish I had my gun now. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. it doesn't prove the point that he's intending to prove, in my opinion. It's the whole thing is stupid. And and by the way, this whole comic is like 13 pages. This is two whole pages of it. It's just the action sequence. It is by far the longest like set of panels dedicated to action and not storytelling in the whole thing. It's so yeah. weird to me. So yeah, Batman Batman punches them or sorry, Robin punches them up a bunch. He wins. They end up tied up again at the end. And at the end of the sequence, Batman looks directly at at, at us. Yeah, straight out of the panel, like yeah. right, right straight out, like not off to the side or anything, like straight out at us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he says, "Well, kids, there's your proof. Crooks are yellow without their guns. Don't go admiring them, them and all their kind." Underlined. So now that we're done with that weird aside, Batman and Robin get all of the loot from the thieves and load up on their boat. They they leave the thieves and criminals on their boat. They get the the loot back to Batman's boat and they take Batman's boat back to the yacht. Do you want to describe what's happening on the on the yacht <laughs> when they return? <laughs> so when they come back to the yacht, there is some sort of a masquerade party occur party occurring. So there's like <laughs> dude dressed up. I mean, it, I think it's supposed to be a clown, like a Victorian era clown. Yeah, because it's got like the the neck rough and stuff. But it it almost looks like a a gigantic bear wearing a clown <laughs> costume. There's, d- there's all sorts of different stuff. There's n- what suits of armor. Mm-hmm. There's people in like detective clothes. There's a police officer. Miss Travers looks like she's like maybe a princess or something. She's wearing like yeah. one of those cone hats with a tassel. Yeah, exactly. Which this whole thing is just bizarre to me. Like, I don't know why you just got, like a bunch of people came on your boat, stuck you up and like robbed you and left. And what are you like? Well, the show must go on. Like we're going to keep mm-hmm. doing the cruise, I guess. And like, I know what we'll do. A masquerade ball. We're all going to dress yeah. up in costumes and have a party. 
It even says in the caption, like, aboard the yacht, the guests are trying to forget their losses by holding a masquerade <laughs> party. What? Yeah. They're not calling the real Coast Guard. They're not headed back home. They're not saying, well, this was a bad idea. They're just going for it. Yeah. They're, like, they all huddled up. And, th- and one person was like, here's what we should do. We should probably, like, write down everything rem- we remember about those dudes. <laughs> everything rem- we re- like, all the eyewitness testimony. Let's see what we can get for evidence. And then someone else was like, I came here to party. And <laughs> all the rest of the group was like, yeah. And so they all partied. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're in this just stupid, I'm just the dumbest situation. Batman shows up. He comes into the and uh, comes into the party, and they all think that he's a party goer, right? And they he's just in a good costume. They're like, "Oh man, like it's Batman!" And he's like putting it on. But then he dumps out a bag full of their stolen property and is like, "Ah, no, I'm the actual Batman." And everyone for some reason thinks this great. Like one person goes, "Oh, how thrilling!" You know, "Oh, it's really Batman!" And there's our stuff. Yeah. They don't uh, let this breathe. They don't like, we're not sitting in this. It's just action, action, action. At that exact moment, someone pulls the fire alarm. And, um, so the alarm's going off and people start panicking. They're going, Oh my gosh, what's going on? They're running for the exits. And in the commotion, Batman notices Mrs. Peggs, who, if you remember, is the one that Denny was helping around the party with the, with the hurt Mm -hmm. ankle. And he sees that she's running in the commotion all of a sudden, which she finds really strange which I think is very stupid because Batman was not on the boat. He doesn't know who Miss Peggs is. He doesn't know that Miss Peggs has a broken ankle. That was Robin, not Batman. But Batman yeah, notices it. Yeah, that's a good point. It's so stupid. Uh, and he says, oh, how strange. You know, Miss Peggs' ankle's doing just fine now. And at that same time, the captain of the boat shows up. And he's like, hey, it's a false alarm. There's no fire. No need to panic. And so everyone's not going to the lifeboats anymore. And Batman's like, let's chase Miss Peggs, right? Because she's acting strangely, you know, suspicious behavior. And so, like, they're chasing her. Robin does, like, a flying dive down a, a, a flight of stairs on top of Miss Peggs, which I think is a really funny visual image of, like, there's this white belt <laughs> old lady. And he's using, like, all of his body weight. <laughs> yeah. Down, like, 10 It is feet. pretty funny. Especially like the the shot right in the center there where it's this white haired old lady like looking over her shoulder like, oh, crap. And and then, yeah, I mean, it's it's like um, it's like WWE, like you've got a, a wrestler who's coming in to just tackle is that that's the whole like body posture, I guess, of, of Robin as he's coming to tackle this old lady. Yeah. And and so they they get there and Batman pulls a wig off of mrs pegs and Mm -hmm. he takes this is this is another wild panel um he takes a rag and rubs the makeup off of miss peg's face and she she says let go of me and then what's what does batman say brian he says you say it quiet it's not yeah he goes quiet or papa spank The, the, this like this whole issue is like what would batman not do like what are things that are outside of batman's character <laughs> it's just like element after element of like oh that's not the batman i know yeah it does it doesn't make any sense i don't i'm not gonna try to rationalize yeah. it i have nothing to say quiet or pop a spank <laughs> <laughs> then batman calls her cat which again I, I, I don't know. I guess maybe Robin and Batman had a conversation about the note that Robin found off panel. Like we didn't see it. They're on the boat. They're coming back. R- you know, Dick is explaining everything that happened that he found the note and that it said cat. I don't know. But Batman definitely wasn't there for that in the story. Um, I, I think you're giving the writers a little bit too much credit because we know that everything they do is on the page. Like uh, w- that if it didn't happen on the page, it didn't happen. So <laughs> like they're they're just really deliberate about everything like they're they're i don't remember exactly what it was but like way at the beginning um robin says to himself oh yeah yeah at the very beginning robin says oh these two people over here are interesting i'll go eavesdrop like he says that out loud yeah to us so he knows what he's doing so the the idea that 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 they there is no conversation on the boat where they're like comparing notes there's not a caption that says it 
sure. to me says it was a silent boat ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, it, it, it definitely seems to be the case that that they want to over explain things like the, the at the beginning of the story. There's a three panel flashback to say Batman read a newspaper to tell us about a party. And then and then we go back to the present day is like, yeah, they're they're definitely trying to like cross eyes uh, and dot T's or whatever. But mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's kind of stupid. Batman has knowledge that we don't think he should uh, calls her cat yeah. and he finds the necklace, Miss Travers necklace in the bandage that's uh, around her ankle. Her sprained right? ankle. Yeah. Yeah. Take, takes the bandage off the ankle and there's there's a necklace there. And then as, as they're like, aha, you're the cat. We knew, you know, we, we found you, um, you, you stole the necklace. Denny shows up with a gun to try and stop Batman, but Batman uses the necklace as like a blunt force object. <laughs> he like, which this necklace is supposedly worth like millions of dollars or whatever, but he's taking it by the chain and there's this big, heavy, you know, pendant. And he's like doing an uppercut swing off of Denny's chin, uh, hits him in the face. Yeah. There, so there was there was one beat there that yeah. I had to read uh, multiple times, and I I still don't know if I get it. But you have to go back to like the very very beginning when Robin asks the when when Dick Grayson asks the other waiter about the the people, and he's like, "Oh yeah, Denny, this always trying to take money off his aunt and right the 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 dudes gambling and stuff like that." So this thing is. Catwoman says, how, how, or no, excuse me, Robin. Oh, this makes it even worse. This, this totally debunks the idea that, that Batman and Robin had a conversation to get on the same page. Okay. Uh, Because Robin says, well, how did you know she was the cat and not Dr. Wallace or Roger? So this means that Robin didn't say, hey, Batman, I'm going to pull the fire alarm so we can see if she runs. Sure, sure, or anything sure, sure. like that. It's just like Batman's putting things together with knowledge he doesn't have. Yeah. Uh, but but so then Robin's like, "How did you know?" And he yeah, and Batman who, who says, "Hold the fire alarm." This is so stupid. I hate this. I just realized. No, Robin did. did no, yeah, that? yeah. It. They say it in this panel. This okay. this is like the most important panel that puts everything together, but in a terrible way. Batman says the note dropped by Denny, Mrs. Uh-huh. Travers' nephew, said he had an accomplice. You remember you said Miss Peggs was a guest of Denny's, not his aunt. So that that's I don't I didn't follow it, but that's supposed to be the explanation for how they knew who the writer of the letter was. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then Catwoman says, you had the kid turn in a false alarm to trap me. Clever. So. It. The there is evidence yeah. here that there was not a conversation, and also yeah. that there was a conversation between Batman and Robin to get Robin to pull the fire alarm to see if the person with the sprained ankle runs. I don't know. It's it's very thin. Yeah, the, it's it, the the important thing to take away here is that like <clears throat> it, this probably made sense in in Bill Finger's head and nobody else, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> create a bunch of cool set pieces, right? Yada yada yada. The the specifics aren't all that important. Yeah, they they, they catch the cat at this moment. The cat puts her arm her arms around Batman's neck and is like, "Hey, like she's kind of throwing herself at him. I'll give you half the jewels, you know, if if we work together. You know, come come be you know live a life of crime with me." And he's like, "No, we work on separate sides of the law." I think it's notable here that he says, "Sorry, your proposition tempts me." <laughs> but we work on different sides. Of, that first part is like, huh? Yeah, yeah, How, yeah. It tempts you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think they're just saying like, you know, th- that's to the reader to let us know that like, yeah, he is attracted to to Catwoman, right? Yeah. Or I'm sorry, the cat. Oh, the cat. You're right. I keep saying yeah, yeah, Catwoman yeah. also. Yeah. Well, I'm, it's, I'm, I apologize. We'll, 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 we'll talk about it here in a minute. But yeah. So the cat, Batman and Robin all load up onto Batman's boat. Um, they've got her, you know, I guess they don't tie her up. They just, they just bring her on the boat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and they leave the yacht to go turn her into the police. But while they're, uh, you know, speeding away from the yacht, she jumps off the boat and she gets away and they're just like, okay, whatever. She's gone, I guess. <laughs> and, 
and they keep uh, driving away and like Robin's talking to him, but like Batman's totally distracted. He's like absentmindedly thinking to himself about like. So so she jumps off the boat and Robin's like, oh, we got to stop her. And then it says that that Batman like, quote, bumps into Robin. Yeah. And then because because of the little confusion there, she gets away. And then Robin's like, ah, I think you bumped me on purpose. You took her along with us so she might get away. And Batman's like, oh, you're crazy. I would never. (laughs) And then thinking to himself, he's like, ooh, what a lovely girl. What eyes say, I mustn't forget. I've got a girl named Julie. Yep. Um, Oh, well, she still had lovely eyes. Maybe I'll bump into her again sometime. And it was just, it's this very weird that he's like, oh, yeah, I've got I've got a girlfriend. But um, man, what a beautiful lady. Like, and yeah, it was tempting. I would leave Batman to to go be with that temptress. Like, whoa, yeah. was a whoa, weird. Batman. It's super weird. Yeah, especially because like he doesn't know anything about her. Like, it's like literally two panels of like they rub the old lady makeup off her face and then she throws himself at, at, at you know, throws herself at him. And then yeah, and then he's just like, you know, enamored. So uh, that's the end. That's the last panel. This is Bob Kane. And as you can see, this is only kind of Catwoman, right? I, I don't know if you yeah. like what is what is your like mental model of what what Catwoman is? Like, what is the things that she has to do in a, in a story? Well, there are a lot of comparisons here to, I would say, the modern Catwoman. Mm-hmm. Like when when we meet uh, Selena Kyle in Dark Knight Rises, she mm-hmm. It, it is because she stole Martha Wayne's necklace from sure. Bruce Wayne. So she she is a cat thief. Like I think that's cat where burglar. the cat yep. cat burglar. Yep. Yeah, cat burglar, not cat thief. But th- there's that connection. And mm-hmm. her wearing disguises. We've seen that before. So there's mm-hmm. a through line there. Mm-hmm. But the rest of the way that they portray her is a little bit interesting. A little odd for me, but oh, and then and then like trying to to create that spark between them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of chemistry like that that's something that i've seen a bunch of of other situations and even uh even the dark knight rises there's the the point where the is it the senator she like kidnaps the senator or something and he is like head over heels in love with her and is like call me mm-hmm, at the mm-hmm. end and so like the idea that she could seduce someone like that quickly sure uh, it does have some some validity but I, I think that there is a much better way to like introduce the cat or Catwoman or whatever this person is supposed to be. Well, that's the thing is that uh, like I don't think that they have an idea of what it was they were introducing. Right? They call her the cat, not Cam- Catwoman at all, because there was no Catwoman. It was just the cat. That's the character, right? They don't call her Selena because she doesn't have a name, right? That's right. She doesn't wear a cat costume because they hadn't had that idea, right? Like, <laughs> there's yes, there, that's right. Yeah. If if you think about it, like you step back, like you don't have any of those preconceptions. And you think about what did they bring of this character? It's a woman who like is attractive to Bruce who s- steals something. That's it, right? Like, there's there's no other, you know, there's nothing else to the character. In fact, if you think about it, like. They spend half of the story not on the yacht <laughs> where Catwoman's not there. Yep. But, you know, she's in a couple panels at the beginning where she's Miss Pegs and they don't explain who she is. She's like writes a, a two sentence letter that says, like, keep this person away from the room. And then on the next the last page, she gets unmasked. Like she's basically not in the book. That's totally fair. Yeah. And you're I mean, I, I think it is super notable that that the things that Bob Kane said aren't Aren't, don't seem to be the case here. Like, mm-hmm. where's the sex appeal? Mm-hmm. Where, how does she show up as the antithesis of of Batman? Mm-hmm. Um, it it is notable that they decided to let her live and and get away so she could come sure. back. That that was a thing that they didn't really seem to do with anyone else except mm-hmm. uh, the Joker because they changed their minds at the very last second mm-hmm. and and let him live so there is there is something there that they decided to keep her around but it doesn't seem that this is following through with the things that bob kane said in in his uh i guess thesis of of where she came from yeah for for me it doesn't necessarily line with what bob kane said but also like 
if I think back to the first Robin story and the first Joker story, which we've just done, Mm -hmm. they kind of come fully formed, right? Like they're dressed like they dress. They say things like they say, they act like they act like there's a whole story that's really actually focused them on as a character. And you're like, yeah, they nailed it. You, you read that Robin story and like, you know, it is Robin. I read this and to me, it's not really Catwoman. So it's more in in a way, it's more like Batman in that, like Batman's took, you know, the first year and change and time to like evolve and, and turn into what Batman would be. Um, and they're adding things to the mythos, you know, uh, as they go. And, and Catwoman is a little bit more like that. So, yeah, it, it is interesting, especially considering that in these early issues, there were a lot of villains that showed up and then died and were gone right away. <laughs> um, and they, didn't take time to like create a backstory or um, a longer story arc in their their life. So this this one it was like they set up this concept of a person that is not very well formed, but they did keep her around mm-hmm. by letting her escape. So a little bit of an aside, unrelated to the story, do you want to describe this little advertisement panel? Or I don't know if it's an ad. This this sort of like last panel at the end of the book. So basically it says, hey, a lot of people have written in and we love the support. So go to the last page. We've got a picture that's worth framing or that's suitable for framing of Batman and Robin. Uh, This is our way of saying thanks. And then it's signed Bob Kane. Yeah, I I think this is really interesting. (laughs) Clearly the story has ended early and they need to fill some more space and they decide to plug the filler page at the end of the book where they needed to fill more space, um, where they, they decided, you know, they made some art for that. And interestingly, if you go to DC, if you, if you're reading this digitally on DC universe and infinite, they don't include this page. <laughs> so Ooh, the whole page or just that, that they include this blur that cell that mentions okay. the back page, but then the page oh. that they talk about framing is not in there. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So thankfully I have the, the omnibus print edition and I'm, I'm pretty sure if you do, like facsimile printings and stuff. They have this in there, yeah. but um, I had to take a picture of my physical book. Um, I don't know if you want to describe that this page to people. Sure. Uh, it's, it's Batman and Robin. It's slightly better than a sketch standing next to each other. Batman's got his hands on his hips and he's looking very heroic and he's smiling big. And then Robin, the boy wonder standing next to him, arms folded still, I mean, just smiling really big. And at the bottom uh, it's like, signed yeah in a way it says like yours for bigger and better thrills batman and the other says and that goes double for me robin and and it is i will say it is kind of funny to me that oh and it also says bob kane up over batman's shoulder which i think is like extra funny (laughs) it does that bob is like i'm gonna get my name up in every child's (laughs) room in america whatever it takes yeah and uh, and then, and then also kind of funnily at the bottom of the page, it's, it says cut out and frame. <laughs> uh, I love this. I, I want a print of this hung on my wall badly. <laughs> There's something that's just so like of the moment, like it feels like so 1930s and so uh, silly and earnest and great. And like, I don't know, this is before like merchandise, like Batman's not appearing on lunch boxes and like backpacks and like whatever, like this is the, the sort of like. This is the prototype picture, right? This is the marketing picture. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you can tell that they've they worked hard to make it look good and to make them like look fit and the shadows in the right spot, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and yeah, and of course, it's the nighttime. They've got the moon behind them and, and whatnot. I do. Th- I do think as like a criticism is that they like went over the writing too many times so that it's it like very much looks fake to me. It doesn't look like someone wrote that and signed it. And it's like oh, from sure. Batman. Not at all. It, not at all. That That's the one area that I think they should have done a, a lot better. Something else that's a little silly. <laughs> I kind of just had this thought. In January of 2021, a copy of Batman number one went up for sale at a heritage auction and sold for $2.2 million. And in that book... Jeez. It gives you direction to cut it up. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So like how many, how many copies of Batman number one were destroyed per instructions in the book (laughs) that would then go on to be worth multiple millions of dollars. That's right. (laughs) 
<laughs> that is really funny. And it, it's like a kind of artificial way to like jack up the price of, of the one that's un, uncut. Oh, I'm sure they weren't thinking about it at all. No one had any inkling that there was. This oh, was yeah. No, I agree. There's no there's no way that anyone is paying attention to that. Yeah. I totally agree with you. But it is kind of funny that like the the readers themselves like made sure that one of those was unintentionally so, but made sure that that one of those was more valuable than all the rest because they were just destroying their own copies. So it's it's like um, artificial uh, uh, drop in supply. Yeah, too funny. You had one more aside before we move on. Yeah, let's jump back to the masquerade. Okay. So there is a line. It says, um, at that moment, a figure steps down from the stairway onto the the dais um, dressed in a weird costume. An ironical joke takes place. So it's um, it's Batman dressed, I mean, dressed as a bat at a masquerade. Um, and this takes place, if I remember correctly, this is all from memory. This takes place before the origin story where, uh, yeah, I think it was in the 60s where they had the the issue where Batman finds the bat suit that oh, Thomas yeah. Wayne wore at a masquerade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I, I thought that that was kind of like a interesting call back, call forward. Yeah, it's like th- there's a connection there, but when they made this comic, they didn't know there was a connection there. That would be interesting. Yeah, I would be interested to know the number of times that Batman has showed up to a masquerade in his costume. It's kind of a fun idea that like <clears throat> he wears a costume all the time, but can we like level the playing field by putting everyone else in a costume and all of a sudden he's normal, right? right? Really, really interesting idea for a set piece. I'm sure it's been done many times in a Batman story, but like uh, d- didn't feel particularly authentic in, in this iteration. <laughs> No, um, I think certainly not. Just because it was sandwiched between other events that were non sequiturs. So yeah, Jerry, uh, let's talk about Jerry Robinson because Jerry Robinson wasn't involved with that story, but he would become involved with how Catwoman would evolve. So here's what they asked Jerry. They said, how did you refine the Catwoman's look? Uh, and Jerry said, uh, I penciled and inked the first story in which the Catwoman appeared in her trademark cowl and cat ears and purple and green costume. And that comes from Nine Lives Has the Catwoman, Batman number 35, uh, 1946. She originally didn't wear a costume, but in an effort to make her more exotic, in keeping with our other bizarre looking villains, we put her in a cat mask. We did this for a while, but it was never very satisfactory. It was very limiting. You couldn't show facial expressions. You couldn't do certain types of stories. It also limited her sexuality with a cowl you could see that she was a beautiful woman. With a cowl, you could see that she was a beautiful woman. I said that right. Okay. It mm-hmm. just make doesn't make sense. I would say with a cowl, you maybe couldn't see, but... Well, uh, in a minute. <laughs> in a minute. Yeah, We're going to look at some I'm pictures getting... and you'll see what they're coming from. Okay. So with a cowl, you could see that she was a beautiful woman and she became more visually interesting. It added another dimension to the strip to add a romantic interest. We probably imitated the dragon lady in Milt Caniff's Terry and the Pirates. I thought Caniff was great. My aunt clipped Terry for me and gave it to me when she had me over for dinner. This next question is good. It's like, Bob had trouble drawing women, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jerry's like, well, Bob had a lot of trouble with women. He thought they <laughs> sucked their souls. <laughs> yeah. How, how about you read the whole thing? Bob, the question is, okay. Bob had trouble drawing women, didn't he? And here's what, what do he say? Uh, Bob didn't have much experience drawing women. Women's figures are a little harder to draw. With heroes, you throw in muscles and nobody knows there isn't a muscle there. What? Okay, with heroes, you throw in muscles and nobody knows there isn't there aren't muscles there. Oh, I get it. So he's saying that you can kind of fool around with her muscles go and readers are none the wiser. I got it. Okay. Uh, You have to really know anatomy to know it doesn't attach there. With women there, uh, with women... There aren't as many muscles. I had more experience drawing women, and I drew more naturalistically. Bob had been a Bigfoot. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Let me see if I've got the rest of it. (laughs) I hope it's like Bob had been a Bigfoot enthusiast. (laughs) (laughs) No. Have you ever heard of Bigfoot Littlefoot cartoons? Yeah, I've heard of that. I don't know if I could tell you what it means. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to butcher it, too. A Bigfoot uh, artist or a Bigfoot cartoon would be silly cartoon. Like, it's 
it's for comedy because the they're you know when you draw a clown he's got gigantic feet oh i see okay little foot would be serious like you're trying to draw it accurately i see Fudge. okay i don't have the rest of that quote just assume that he's saying that like bob was his experience was in bigfoot drawing right like he he drew funnies he didn't draw batman um that's what he was coming from I'm actually really curious if Google will do this. If I just like in quotes, do Bob had been a no. big foot? If it's going to give me the rest. I, I mean, I, I that would be nope. nice. Did not match any documents. This, well. this, this, um, these quotes came from the creators of the superheroes, the Tom Andre book, which I, there is no ebook. Right. And so ah. it's not surprising to me that there's no transcription online. So. There's a lot of stuff while I'm doing research on all this that like the only way to get it is in print. It's all analog only. It's kind of crazy. That is um, really crazy. Yeah, I wish there had been, yeah, Project Gutenberg or whatever um, for all this stuff. But okay. So yeah, basically Jerry's talking about like <laughs> the fact that Bob probably didn't have much to do with the way that Catwoman looked at all. Um, we can probably thank uh, Jerry for what we think of as 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 the Catwoman image. And then he kind of n dials in on this theme that I was trying to talk about earlier of like the highly iterative nature of like how Catwoman evolved over time. And so I, I actually have here snippets from a bunch of different issues of the way that they depict her over time. So first we have the sort of only visuals we have of her from Batman number one. Mm hmm. Where she's an old lady, and then she's a really a attractive young woman after they rub off the the makeup, you know, mm -hmm. quieter Papa Spank. <laughs> yep. And then you were saying, I don't understand how someone in a cowl, we can see, understand more about them. He's comparing that to, to the cat mask. So here we have Batman number three. Take a look. Tell me what you see and what you think. It's a really weird combination of things. So it's, it's like a woman in a dress, like a gold dress. You can <laughs> see... Um, her like bare legs while she's running in high heels and stuff. She's carrying some kind of chest of, of treasure or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then on that, she's got a massive red uh, cape flowing behind her, which is <laughs> kind of a weird juxtaposition. And then instead of a face, she's got the cat head. Yeah. Um, and it looks furry, like anatomically accurate cat head. Right. Like Jerry described this as a mask. I would not call this a mask. This is like, you know, they've just just dressed her up as like Mickey Mouse at Disney World. and She's going to go talk to the kids <laughs> or, you know, she's wearing the Tony the Tar Tiger get up. You know, um, she's your school's mascot. I I actually I'm going to. Oh, I see the mask versus the cowl. OK, so this does make more sense. I was really thrown because I was comparing a cowl to nothing at all. <laughs> and so when they're saying it, it also limited her sexuality with the cowl, you could see that she was a beautiful woman and she yes. became more visually interesting. But with the mask. I like, I, but if you compare it to the mask, if you're like, if, if the, so the real statement is with the cowl, instead of a, a nasty <laughs> mask, you could see that she was a beautiful woman. Yeah, it's like, no, oh, okay, it's, yeah. it's true. If you look, look at this drawing, right? She's got like a freaking Chuck E. Cheese head. Right. And yeah. is yes, there any yes, Chuck E. Cheese? Did she look attractive at all? And it, like they're trying desperately to show as much leg as they can. Right. Yeah. So, so that there's some shred of like femininity going on while she's wearing the Donnie Darko head. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, they, yeah. They are not visually appealing face face shapes at all. Like, I mean, it's it's the uh, Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. It's like, I'll, I'll wear this to hide what's underneath. Like, it's it's. Yeah, it's not very like 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 you were saying, like, yeah, they're trying desperately to show as much leg as they could to like be some kind of revealing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. But yeah, the mask ain't, ain't great. So that's Batman number three. Clearly, it's not really working. So they decide to change it a little bit more. Batman number 10, they've iterated further. What do we got? They double down. <laughs> <laughs> Batman number 10, the, the whole body is is cat villain it's mm -hmm. i mean it's like a i i am i'll be honest i immediately think of sergeant pepper's only hearts club band mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. the, for that the beatles but like it's got a like what do you call the the dude in the front of the band the marching band with the um a drum major i guess yeah 
Sure. It's like the drum major suit, but it's like black and black sleeves and black gloves with with like sharp um, nails on the tips. And then this purple, yeah, Dracula cape though, but it's got like this, it's got this big collar that goes up halfway up, up their head. Totally sexless. <laughs> so going back to Bob Kane saying like, we really need to add some sex appeal to this comic. And they just brought in like a, a an angry mutant cat <laughs> human <laughs> thing, you know, um, that by the cover, it doesn't look like there's a person in there at all. Um, mm-hmm. And then, yeah, it's the same same crazy uh, masks situation. Yeah, this this is not um, symbolically a cat woman. This is a cat dash woman. This is a woman that is a cat. <laughs> yes. It's like yeah, yeah. fully uh, personified as as a anthropomorphic. Yeah, there's even um, Batman the Animated Series episodes where there, I can't remember the doctor's name, but he has a serum that like turns people into cats that are... Mm-hmm eight seven feet tall or whatever yeah this looks like that if you've seen those this looks like that with a cape yeah and then and then jerry says that he puts her in a cowl and so that's Mm -hmm. batman number 35 which is her eighth appearance so there's she shows up seven times not looking anything like a Catwoman successively worse <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and then on her eighth appearance she she jerry robinson gives her a redesign and she looks like this do you want to describe her yeah i mean that so it is funny that it's like episode by episode you're just watching this person with like a cat disease like going into the next <laughs> stage and the next stage yeah and then yeah eighth appearance completely different Yes, uh, entirely it's different. B- b- entirely different. Yeah, there, so there's a cowl, and, and cowl very similar to Batman's cowl, but mm-hmm. it's a little more curvaceous. The ears are a little bit shorter, more like cats. Um, cats' ears are more like what I think you would we'd find familiar with with modern takes on Catwoman. Her blonde hair is showing. Her mouth is showing. Her eyes are showing. Like mu- very much of her face is is actually visible because. <laughs> And and then yeah, she's got a I would say a pretty smart, like business person suit on, purple head to toe with a little white collar, um, and then yeah, I, it's it's if you took if you took the cowl off, she would look like she worked at a bank. Kinda yeah, she's she's got um, purple gloves that kind of go all the way up her forearm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if she didn't have the green cape, then she would look uh, like more professional. Um, it is very, very, very form fitting. So she's kind of got the hourglass shape where it's very tight at the waist yep. and then kind of come up. What's interesting to me is that she has so, sort of the stylistic flourish. So where her collar comes in, she's got the white collar and then at, below it, it's got like a little um, b- boob window. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a little bit, there's a tiny shot of cleavage where it's like a low cut shirt, but buttoned at the top. So there's like a little, it's really little weird. slit opening. Yeah. yeah it's the sort of thing that you might expect to see on yeah like you said a professional dress but then like there's some sort of dress or slip or something else underneath it so that you're seeing a pop of color not a pop of skin um c- certainly in the 30s right or you know when this would have been taking place i, I would not have spe- expect cleavage to be a thing that you're seeing at a bank <laughs> yeah they, they i think they did say that uh jerry said he ripped off oh yeah right up here nine lives of the catwoman batman 35 1946 that's it up in uh Jer- the book that uh we referenced earlier so this is 1946 so just after okay. the war ended yeah but i would also say at that time i would wager that m- most of these these um fashion details except for the cowl and the cape would be pretty normal to see on sure. the street like women wearing gloves that go up uh, mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. almost to their elbows that match match their business suit or whatever you, you call that that attire <laughs> so yeah that's that's how her visual style evolved but like she continued to evolve as well um she didn't get any sort of backstory or name at all for 10 years so in 1950 in batman number 62 um, she finally gets the name selena kyle and they she finally gets a, a, a backstory but by the by i read that for this prep for this episode because i thought maybe we would we would read that and summarize that episode instead because it gives her a backstory that story is also awful (laughs) she doesn't have a good backstory like the gist is that she was an airline attendant 
Okay. That was in a plane crash and she hit her head and she got amnesia. And because she couldn't remember who she was, she turned to a life of crime. That's oh, it. Okay. That's her backstory. Weird. And in that story, Batman number 62, she hits her head again and then all of a sudden remembers that she was a stewardess before. And she has, you know, second thoughts and is like, oh man, I don't want to be a criminal. So she decides to help, you know, Batman and Gordon like catch the criminal enterprise that she's working with. That's the entire story. It, it's awful. It's horrible. <laughs> and like, you know, one of, again, only 16 appearances in, in the golden age. Like the best they got for her is she's a stewardess. So. Yeah, that's pretty rough. So any last thoughts on Catwoman, uh, Golden Age Catwoman, before we we close? Really interesting. Like, I mean, kind of like what I was saying before is um, I thought she was newer than mm-hmm. she turned out to be. And the, uh, the, the I guess the variations and changes over time uh, kind of makes sense knowing what we know about some of the other um, historical characters. Um, I, I do think it's interesting what you were pointing out in this very first uh, issue where the cat shows up, all the things that they didn't get, get the, the things that didn't stay, the, the, the very loosely formed elements. But it's also interesting the things that did stick around. Mm. Um, the, like the things I pointed out, there's very small handful of things, but they, they do still connect with like the contemporary or, or modern um, version of Catwoman. I think all those different things are are interesting. Like what what degraded, what dissolved, but then mm-hmm. also what stuck. They did hit upon a, like a really cool idea. Like what about um, just a super talented burglar, right? Someone that is not the organized crime and it's not petty theft, right? But what about the the person who is doing the big, you know, jewel heist and like is in and out like a ninja, like, you know, uh, unseen, right? Uh, behind the scenes. And like, what if that person, because of that sort of elevated level of interest that we have in them, it also reaches to like an elevated le- level of interest for Bruce and for Batman, right? Um, that's really interesting. I think, I think also the, the, like, you know, despite the, the gender dynamics, <laughs> right. Being very much of their time and like, let's be yeah. honest, problematic. There's something that's really interesting about the idea of, of sort of a sexual tension of a, of a, of a, not just interested in, in each other because of their talents or because of their position in life, but also because there's some sort of spark. There's some sort of chemistry. I think it's a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. E- especially like the the idea of like the uh the the forbidden nature of mm. that spark because Batman is the hero and at this point Catwoman is a villain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Super cool. I so I am also noticing that uh, I'm kind of I'm noticing some patterns that are going to create some lenses that I will look at this stuff through in the future. Like um the characters that probably the, the characters from Batman contemporary that mm. probably are very, very old are humans that have no superpowers. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Be- because so far everyone's been human and no one has had a mystical power. They've just been really smart or they've been very skilled or they've been yeah. deranged or something like that. Um, but like Clayface doesn't show up for a long time. I'm assuming because they probably didn't get into the supernatural uh, nature of some of the characters for a long time. I'm not sure. I think um, Clayface definitely is on my list of like characters I want to talk about soon, but I think that has more to do with me mm-hmm. being interested in him. I-, I wouldn't be surprised yeah, if yeah. he's Golden Age, but there's definitely less. Like Solomon Grundy, I think is newer. You know, Killer Croc, Man Bat. I'm trying to think like of who the sort of like supernatural villains I'd say Mr. Freeze uh, applies to that because mm-hmm, mm-hmm, he's mm-hmm. super cold because of a, a chemical mm-hmm. plant situation. Yeah. And we, I mean, we did, we did get like in, in the Gardner Fox issues, we had like vampires and stuff and like gigantic, you know, no, oh, that's true. Gorilla things. Had a, a full on vamp vampire. That's right. But I think you're right. Like, you know, I, I'm hoping that we can move on to the silver age soon. I don't, I don't want to spend like we're what this is issue number or sorry episode number like eighteen. I'd be really upset if like in issue thirty six we're still doing golden age <laughs> stuff and we haven't gotten past it. 
but that being said, I think we were going to do a few more. Like I think we're going to do the first penguin and, and some other things like that soon. I th- I think the pattern definitely is that the recurring characters, the important characters, do tend to be more like Batman in that the things that make them interesting are that they're sort of um, – the ideal specimen of like whatever they are, like the best burglar, the best, you know, strongest, uh, y- you know, strong man, the, you know, um, the zaniest joker <laughs> or whatever there, but the, the, there's not a supernatural element. That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine that like if, if my wife were here, she, she compares to the Sims a lot. So it's a, mm. a video, video game she likes to play. And, uh, she talks about like how the Sims have all their like bars, their, their skills or their needs or whatever, like their, wh- whether they're hungry or whether they're tired, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it would probably be some expo- uh, some description of like, whatever that skill is maxing it out to 11 mm-hmm. and seeing what kind of caricature comes out of that. And, Oh, it's the Riddler this time, mm-hmm. you know? And so, yeah, that, that is a, that's a really interesting point to say that they, the, major characters that show up are the best at something Mm -mm. it just might be the best at insanity or the best at riddles or the best at um thievery or whatever yeah we'll have to come back to that hypothesis as we as we introduce some more of these villains we'll see like does that still hold true because uh Mm -hmm. yeah it's an interesting idea for sure Hey, Bat Family, we're throwing up the Bat Signal. If you made it this far, we hope you like the show. If you put a like on the video, it'll help us find more Cape Crusaders. And if you subscribe, you'll never miss a future episode. Drop a comment down below telling us what we got wrong. Or you can head on over to batlessons.com and write us an email or send us a voice memo. We'll talk about your feedback on a future episode of the show. That's also where you can find show notes and transcripts for every episode and links to all of our social media. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 